Well, I want to start out by thanking Scott, not only for organizing this landmark conference, but because the preposition with Scott Hurshigi doesn't begin to describe his role in co-authoring this book. He conceived the idea, he compiled the materials, he talked to the publisher, he chose the titles, he did everything. All the things I could not have done because I am getting much older. But Scott, I first met Scott as he referred to at the Asian American Activist Conference in, at UCLA. And I'll never forget that conference. They were activists, but we carried on a discussion with three to 400 people in an auditorium on what is revolution. A theoretical discussion that was extraordinary. I had never had that experience with activists. And I think that gives us some idea of how important the Asian American movement is. And I'm, I, I hope that during this conference we'll talk about what role we have to play at this time on the clock of the world. Because what's happening in Japan, what's happening in China, shows that the experience we've had with the catastrophic consequences of technological overdevelopment and use and exploitation of the earth and resources of the earth and of other peoples, what that does to a society, the calamities, the catastrophes that bring that about. It's wonderful to be here with Mabel and with Michael. I remember when we first had the news of Rob and Mabel warning the Ku Klux Klan that they were going to defend themselves in the late 50s. It was an amazing experience that just excited all of us in the Black Power movement all over the country. And I remember we sent Reginald Wilson, who became president of Wayne County Community College, to Monroe with guns <laughs> to help in the movement. And I remember also when Robin Mabel had to leave Monroe in 1961, and the FBI came to our door and asked us if we could tell them where, he, where they were. And Jimmy said, <laughs> so interesting, he not only told them he wouldn't tell them, but he told them, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You should be organizing against J. Edgar Hoover. You should not allow him to push you around. <laughs> That's the sort of thing that Jimmy would do. And when, when, my, when Rob and Mabel were in Cuba, so many people went here from Detroit and from all over the country in the Black Power Movement to talk with them. And one of them was Max Stanford, who is now also known as Muhammad Ahmed, and who came back and talked a lot with Malcolm. And his conversations with Malcolm were very much responsible for Malcolm's grassroots leadership speech in November 1963. So all of this is all interconnected and all comes back to me as I sit next to Mabel this evening. And also very exciting to be here with Michael. Most people know Michael through the books he's written with Antonio Negri, Empire, Multitudes, and Commonwealth. But I particularly love this book. And I urge everybody to get it because it's a wonderful book in which he talks about America and this country. And he talks about how both, for both Lenin and Jefferson, there was a distinction between rebellion, which takes place like an explosion, and revolution, which takes participation and participation in self-government. 
and takes a long time. It's a wonderful little book. It's called Michael Hart on Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. You know, this is a time that requires the growth of our souls. I don't know what poor people mean by that, but you'll find cards at the back of the room that give the title of the six chapters of this, uh, the next American Revolution. The first chapter is entitled, These Are the Times to Grow Our Souls. I wish you would think about that. What do you mean by growing your soul? What do you mean by soul? Do you mean some sort of thing, some sort of material thing? Or do you mean the power that we have to reflect, to make choices, to embrace the power that we had within ourselves, to create the world anew? That's what I mean by soul. And I hope that that will, will, will be able to change the language that we all speak, so that we talk about soul in that way, about the power we have within us to create the world anew. And this next chapter is called Revolution as a New Beginning. You know, it's very hard to talk about revolution when you haven't discussed revolution, when you have all sorts of ideas in your mind about what revolution is, you think it's taking over the Kremlin or the White House. Think about that. What does it mean to make a revolution? How do you really make a new beginning? And how, why is this such a wonderful time on the clock of the universe when we are challenged and we find it both necessary and possible to create the world anew? And the third chapter is called, Let's Talk About Malcolm and Martin. What do you think? Who do you think Malcolm was? Do you see Malcolm only as saying, by all means necessary? Or do you recognize that Malcolm was constantly transforming himself up to the very end, a few months before he died? He talked about how I'm a Muslim and I'm a revolutionary, but I'm not sure what's involved in revolution. He was still struggling with the concept and with the practice of revolution. And he went down to Selma to meet with Martin, to tell him that he appreciated what he was doing. And so you don't, don't, don't put, don't put, create, a, create a binary or polarization between Martin and Malcolm. Understand that they were both about the change that we must be in the world. And the next chapter is talk about, it's called Detroit, Place and Space to Begin Anew. What image do you have in your mind about Detroit? Do you see only empty lots and abandoned buildings and trash all over the place? Or do you see the empty lots as we who live there see them as opportunities to grow food for the community, to become more self-reliant, to begin anew, to be, bring the neighbor back into the hood. Opportunities and challenges which the residents of Detroit face every day. And so in Detroit, you, you, I, I urge you to come to Detroit and see, for, and talk to the people here from Detroit and what opportunities exist there and how deindustrialization and devastation have actually created opportunity. I think that unless we give in thinking that way, that when people, when we are attacked by the Scott Walkers of Wisconsin and the, uh, the Snyders of Michigan, that we shouldn't only defend the past, we should see the attack as an opportunity to create something new. And this time is a time on the clock of the world when we had make a huge leap forward in what it means to be a human being. And for those of you who think that the 60s were wonderful, and they were, they're very exciting, 
the next decade of the 21st century is even more challenging. It's our opportunity to create a, I think the phrase was by, used by Nicholas and, in the last workshop, it's an opportunity for us to create a new political subjectivity. That doesn't come very often. We are a very fortunate generation, and I can't believe I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> the next chapter is called A Paradigm Shift in our concept of education. Please, I hope from now on, people will use the word paradigm shift. Talk about it with everybody. Think about what a paradigm shift there was in the Copernican Revolution, when people began to realize that it was not the sun going around the earth, but the earth going around the sun. How many changes were involved in the way that we thought and I think we have to understand that we're at a time for a revolution, a cultural revolution as wide ranging and as profound as that from hunting and gathering to agriculture 11,000 years ago and from agriculture to industry a few hundred years ago. We have to make a paradigm shift in the way we think a paradigm shift in what we think about work as contrasted with jobs, why human beings have worked for so many years, how we have evolved. And we haven't evolved by doing jobs. We've evolved because we worked in order to create goods and services, in order to develop our skills, in order to have an opportunity to work collectively. Those are cultural shifts we're in the middle of that kind of cultural revolution. And we are so fortunate, and your generation is so fortunate to be engaged in that and to have the opportunity to make a great leap forward in the evolution of humanity. The final chapter is entitled, We Are the Leaders We Are Looking For. Think of that. Think of the difference between the kind of vertical leadership that was characteristic of the revolutions of the past that were very patriarchal. And contrast that with the kind of horizontal, more feminine leadership that is developing in this period. I, got the, I heard the phrase when I was listening to a young woman who was a SNCC uh, volunteer at 16 in the South. And she was very wary and fearful of going from door to door, asking people in this little Mississippi city to register to vote. And the first door she knocked on, the people who came to the door said, we've been waiting for you. People are waiting for us. People are waiting for us to come forward with the challenge that we can change this country and that loving it means changing this country. That's why I urge you to listen to Michael's lectures. He did lecture a couple of years ago uh, in England, seven lectures on love. You can find them on YouTube. And I also urge you to read this book, Michael's Hearts, Thomas Jefferson, Declaration of Independence. Thank you. <laughs>